We're in Revelation, how it all ends. We're in our ninth part, and it's a question to each of you. Do you know how to stay connected to God to the very end? I was thinking about what's going on in the Ukraine recently uh, in that battle. If you're reading about it, um, in one city, uh, they knew that the bombardment was coming, and so all the people thought the safest place to go in their 10, 15, 20-story high apartment building was into the basement. And so the, the people all went down into the basement and were down there in the bomb shelter when the missiles hit. And the missiles must have struck some very good places of structurally because it collapsed the building. And what they said is that by the time the rescuers were able, you know, over the days to dig down, that it was too late and all the people that had been down there. But they had survived for a while. So, you know, there, there's this thought of what do you do when you're kind of trapped and the clock is running out, the air is running out and everything. And I thought, we're the, the perfect ones. Do you know how to stay connected to God to the very end? Uh, if you were on a crashing airplane, what would you do? I had a friend that was on a crashing airplane. He was on a hijacked airplane. And the, the airplane was, was commandeered off the coast of Ethiopia and taken off to the island of... Um, in the Maldives, I forget what the name of it is, but Comoros, I think it's called. And they ran out of gas on the way, and the plane crashed. The hijacked plane crashed. And about half the people on board survived, but Andy didn't. But his wife, they were uh, friend, missionary friends of the, of the church Bonnie and I were serving at, and the wife sent us this message. And it was wonderful. She said, I'll never forget for the rest of my life, the distinct sound of my husband's seatbelt clicking. She said, as soon as the hijacker said, I'm taking this plane, and the pilot says, we don't have enough gas, we're going to crash. She said, there was a distinct click of my husband's seatbelt. She said, he got up, sat on the arm of his chair, looked down this row, and started confronting all the people with the gospel. And when he got all done, he turned around to his wife and went, which she took to mean one of them trusted the Lord. He went further down the aisle, sat on an arm, looked at those people. Then he turned and sat on the other arm, looked at those people. She said he had made it within a couple of rows of the very back of the plane. When the wing hit the water and it started the tumbling and his section of the airplane broke off and those people died. And she said, but the last time when he turned, he went, he was on his 22nd person. He led to the Lord. I thought that's a great illustration. We're all on a crashing airplane. This world is headed toward, we know the ending. Boy, it's right there, how it all ends. And you know we have a choice, either stay in our seat with the seat belt fastened or unfasten it and start telling people how to stay connected to God to the very end, to your last breath, to whatever is going on. So that's what we're going to learn today. Now remember, we're in a new section. Uh, and this outline is very important. You're going to see it, you know, every class, and it's going to be on the final exam, kind of like uh, this matching thing. Uh, but we're in the second section. We've, we've gone from Christ's church on earth, and all of a sudden we see them in heaven. That's chapter 4 and chapter 5. And so that's, and then we'll see them again in chapter 19. Uh, if you like pictures, you know, here it is in a picture form. We've gone from the church on earth in chapter 1, 2, and 3, to now the church is in heaven. And you see that Bema seat thing, that's the judgment seat of Christ, and uh, that's what is going to be our focus when we get there. But these people that we're talking about, as I've told you each time, were given the book of Revelation as their guide to how to live in an ever-darkening world, a world that Jesus tells us is going to have more and more wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence, and that Jesus said that evil is going to abound so strongly that the love of most believers is going to grow cold. It's not a very positive. I mean, Jesus uh, had a very negative view of the future, if you want to be honest, and he's one that told us about it. Now, I just took a, I haven't had time because Bonnie and I are on the road too much, but uh, I was teaching somewhere with a marker board, and I took a picture of it because I didn't have time to make a slide. But if you think about the book of Revelation, it's kind of like uh, if you've ever seen those Russian dolls where there's a big doll, and if you take the top off, there's a smaller doll inside. If you take 
the top off that one. There's a smaller one, the, the Matriska dolls. They all fit inside of each other. The book of Revelation is like the big doll, the encompassing, the covering one is chapter one, Jesus is God the Son. He's the image of God, all the attributes. I already talked to you about all that, the creator, the redeemer, and the judge. Within that context comes chapters two and three, which is we are his church. And, and it's all about how he wants us to live as the world gets darker and darker and darker. Then, the part everybody is so you know, enamored with of Revelation, the map of the end of the world. The only thing we need to know about that is that Jesus is gonna right all wrongs. We don't have to be trying to figure out when each little part's gonna happen. Uh, that was always um, a negative. Do you remember even the Thessalonians were doing that? They, they thought when they saw Domitian uh, doing, or, or Nero, in their time, doing what he was doing, they thought the Lord had returned and left him behind, kind of like the Left Behind series. And Paul says, hmm, don't worry about that. You're not going to be left behind if you're saved. What you worry about is whether you're, you're doing, living how Jesus wants us to live in this ever-darkening world. So what is our fourth chapter about? How, stay, how to stay connected to God. It's our greatest need. Not just at the end of the world, today. And that's what this chapter is all about. Well, it starts, and if you go to chapter 4 of the book of Revelation in verse 1, and I'll go to chapter 4 and get there with you in verse 1. And after these things I looked. Isn't it interesting? I'm going to talk about this uh, uh, Lord willing Monday, but isn't it interesting that John presents the book of Revelation as if it's a continuous event? I mean, it's, it's almost like a movie script. It's, it's all these cues, you know, look up, look over there. And so what he says is, after all this stuff, Jesus visiting me on the island of Patmos and talking to me, I looked up, and behold, there's a door standing open in heaven. And a, the first voice, which I heard like a trumpet speaking to me, said, come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Must. Remember yesterday I, I ended with uh, Jeremiah one twelve. God is watching over his word to perform it. I love this. Must take place. Everything God said is going to happen is going to happen. Must take place. So what I wrote, remember what you're looking at, this is my journal and I've typed it out for you. Heaven is a real place existing at this moment. That was my observation. That was my application to my life because I need to remember that because I am so prone to think about this place, the earth, and all of its problems. After these things, verse 1, which summarizes the words and events of chapters 1, 2, 3, a new scene unfolds before John's eyes, just as real as those early churches of chapter 2 and 3 was, the throne of God that towers over everything happening to John and Patmos. It was just as real. But John needed to be reminded of that. I need to be reminded of that. You need to be reminded of that. That right now, with all the things, you know, wondering if you're going to have enough money for that and, and whether or not you're going to be able to have enough strength for this and all of your fears and trepidations about your missions, experience, exposure, whatever that thing is that's coming, is coming. And then the summer, and then after the summer, and then, you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend or parents or hope your parents or maybe they're splitting up or someone's dying of cancer or whatever. We have all this stuff that's kind of our whole world. And the Lord says, oh, oh, wait a minute. Towering over all that is my throne. And, and how Jesus describes his father on the throne is, is huge. Uh, that's the message. Heaven is real right now, and God's throne is there. Number two, look at verse two. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, uh, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Wow. Who's on the throne? Well, you know, people, you know, we, we talk about Jesus seated at the right hand of the throne, the majesty on high. When you see God, you're seeing Jesus. But when you don't see God sitting on the throne. It's God the Father because he is a spirit and, and the throne, I mean, God doesn't have a body. It, theologically, he's non-corporeal. He is a spirit. He's an infinite spirit. He is, he is also omnipresent spirit. He's not localized. 
But when he's manifested in a visible form, walking around, talking to people, most often it's Jesus. Now, we, I'm, I'm sure I heard Mark uh, Strout. I love coming in for his class. There's a lot of discussion whether Genesis 18 is the whole trinity. When Abraham has three visitors who are talking, saying, what, we're, what are we going to do about Sodom? So there are times that it is possible that there are theophanies, not just Christophanies. Christophany is when Jesus shows up in the Old Testament, like the angel of the Lord. A theophany would be when God has some kind of a form. So, and I'm not teaching Old Testament theology, but what Jesus wanted them and us to see is that God is seated on the throne. And all is well and all is calm. Just like it says, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus references over and over and over when he's talking to people worrying about what they're going to eat the next day. He said, why are you all troubled when your Father, who is in heaven, is seated on the throne? So we're going to come back to that. Now look at the throne passages. Um, This is the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, the throne's mentioned once. Chapter 2, twice. Chapter 3, twice. Chapter 4, off the charts. You know, we're talking about this is the And for people that repeatedly read the Bible, you start seeing things like this. I mean, if you want to know about the throne of God, it's throne, 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 all the way through the chapter. So it becomes, for people that are looking for the key chapter on any topic, it becomes the most important chapter. Then chapter 5, there are only uh, five references, 6, 1, 7, back up to 7 references, 8, 1, not at all in 9. 9 is a horrible chapter. It's about when Apollyon, the destroyer, and his demon monsters get set loose in chapter 10, not. And 11, 1, 12, 1, 13, you see him going on through, and then it gets heavy when we get near the ending. But what is our Father on the throne like? Well, for just a minute, look at Matthew 5, because I want you to see in the Sermon on the Mount how Jesus describes the one seated on the throne. Our Father is the one seated on the throne, starting in verse 16. Uh, Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, good. Number two, he says in verse 34, so we're supposed to glorify him. uh, But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is what? What does verse 34 say heaven is? God's throne. You know, people, they wonder what heaven's like. Heaven is God's throne. It's where our Father is seated. It's it's what we're going to study today. It's amazing. Look at verse 45. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. What does he do from his throne? He makes his son to rise in the evil and the good. Did you know that God... The scriptures tell us, Colossians 1 tells us that God, through Jesus Christ, holds the universe together. There is a lot, I mean, nuclear uh, physicists and theoretical astrophysicists and, and all the people at MIT and Caltech and all the great thinkers of the world still have not solved the, the very basic question. We know that like charges repel Right? You remember that from high school chemistry. So how do atoms stay together when they have like charged particles at the nucleus? If they repel, why don't they repel? Well, because Colossians 1 says that by him all things hold together. So what happens when God stops holding everything together? Oh, that's Second Peter chapter 3. It says the whole universe dissolves. It melts. That's actually what it says. Peter says the universe melts with a fervent heat. So God, who through Christ created the world in Genesis, in Revelation between chapter 20 and 21, is 2 Peter 3, the events. And he uncreates the universe. And it just dissolves. So he's, heaven is his throne. Uh, look at verse 48. It says, therefore, you should be perfect just like your Father in heaven is perfect. Wow. So we learned about him, you know, in in verse 16, 
that we're supposed to glorify him. And, you know, I mean, he's seated and his throne is heaven, and now we're, he's perfect. So, and if you keep going in chapter 6, verse 1, uh, it says, Take heed that you do, not be, you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Do you know what that's implying? He's watching everything we do. Wow. Uh, keep going to verse 4. Your charitable deeds may be done in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. This is the one Joseph knew about when Joseph told Potiphar's wife, I can't do that because God is watching. Boy, Joseph had a very practical understanding of the scriptures. Look at verse 6 of Matthew 6. When you pray in your room and when you've shut your door, pray to your father who is, he's not just seeing and watching. Look what it says. He is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I mean, this father is amazing, but it gets even better in verse 8 of chapter 6. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. He is a really good father. You know, there's that song, you know, you're a good, good father, you know, and, and that's who you are, that's who you are. Yeah, boy, that's a nice song, but boy, the truth of the scriptures is something that we should think about. That's who's seated on that throne. But I love, look, the second point there is uh, our Father knows each hop of every bird. Uh, it's fun to sit on park benches or benches anywhere and watch the birds. They're very, you know, nervous. They're flittery. You know, they're always, you know, looking in every direction, you know, and they don't stand still very much unless they found something and they're pecking on it. But look at what it says in Matthew chapter 10 about birds. Starting uh, in verse 29. Um, well, I'll start in 28 since I underlined it. Do not fear those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. That's a whammo verse. But verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? and not one of them falls to the ground. Now that's interesting, that's one of those Greek parts of the text, actually it's called a variant. That means that Western manuscripts have one spelling and Eastern manuscripts have another, and I'm sure you have a whole class on that. This, it could be falls to the ground like the birds are doing in Mexico City because the pollution is so strong, and they just their little lungs breathe too much of it and it kills them and they fall to the ground. It could be death. But literally, this word, literally, the majority word is not drops out of the air and dies, it's hops. Every time a bird, you notice they, they, they jump up a little bit and they land again. They jump up a little bit and land again. It's interesting that they don't walk. They hop, many of them. Every hop apart from your Father's will. They don't hop unless God continues to give them life. And, and look what he says. Uh, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus was big on revealing the Father. In fact, that's the whole purpose of the book of Revelation. Remember, we started way back on day one. Uh, saying that the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave to God the Son, to give to John, to give to the churches. Why? Because the more you know about Christ, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the one on the throne. But, but look at the last line up there. Jesus tells us, doesn't just tell us. Look at chapter 6, verse 9 of Matthew. There are 73 Greek words in this passage, starting in verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. By the way, you can look up in your logos, that is an imperative. That, that it isn't a suggestion. Jesus said, this is the way I want you to pray. I'm not saying you have five options. You're walking down the, you know, the line at lunch, and you don't like French, you'll take Thousand Island. No, no, this is the manner. He doesn't say the words you're supposed to quote. He said this is the manner, this is the way, this is the pattern you're supposed to pray. And then he said this, this is how to approach.
approach our Father. And he gives that beautiful prayer, which starts with, Our Father, which art in heaven. Wow. And that's where our worship is to be pointed. L look what it says in verse 3. We're back to Revelation now, chapter 4, and verse 3. Revelation 4, and verse 3. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an em emerald. Every time worship is portrayed in the Bible, it always has three elements. Now we're going into Revelation 4 is the worship scene of heaven. I mean, it's, it's what God wants. It's what God's in, totally in charge of. It's how he wants it, and that's how it's done. It's very important. But whenever God talks about worship, there are three perspectives always presented. And if you really read the scriptures closely, all three elements have to be right or the worship is wrong. Now that should be sobering, especially all of you that are going into worship ministries. Uh, it's very interesting how, how we talk so lightly about worship and, and people talk about how many different ways we can worship when actually God says, if you don't follow the, the, the directions I've given you, your worship is wrong, no matter how nice it sounds, and no matter how popular it is, and no matter how much the audience responds to it, I'm not. See, that's very important to know. It's serious. So the person offering the worship, the person that comes to offer, the Lord, remember what Jesus said? If you're on your way to bring a gift of worship to God, and you realize that there is someone in the whole world that you are out of sorts with, and you are you have a broken relationship with, there's something unsettled. You have the old-fashioned words, ought, against anyone. You, you are out of sorts with your parents, with your husband, wife, with your children, with your employer. If you are out of sorts, leave your gift. Don't offer it. Go get right with them. Then come back and offer it. Do you know what would happen? we wouldn't have a lot of worship crews on Sunday morning up there tuning up. Did you realize that? God says, I can't accept that from you. You know what I love to watch? I love to watch whether or not, you know, in all these uh, different groups that are leading us in worship, whether or not all the people that are playing the instruments, whether or not they're participating. It's wonderful to see a drummer who can, I don't know, the synaptic firestorm in a drummer's brain must be amazing because they're, they're, they're doing so many different, I mean, they're moving every part of themselves at once, you know, uh, doing all that. But when you see one that's not only doing all that, but they're singing along, you see, they're not just, they're not just doing their skill. They're offering their personal. I mean, they're offering their skill to the Lord, but they're doubling it. They're singing. And those same with those guitarists and everybody else and the pianist. And, and, you know, during COVID, we watched a lot of the mega services, you know, that had the online services and, you know, whether it was, uh, I forget the guy, the Harvest, Greg Laurie's band. I love to watch the camera going between all of them or uh, Matt Chandler's, you know, band watching, you know, or whoever, you know, it's, it's interesting. And you know what was fascinating? I don't know if they put a bulletin out, but it was rare to see a musician even when there's like 15 of them that wasn't participating, singing along with the music. So the person offering the worship has to be right with God. The offering that they're bringing has to be right with God. You say, what is that? Well, look, look at the verse at the bottom. God is the spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. And you know there, there are two ways of applying that. Energized by the spirit, or, you know, zealously in the spirit, engaged. So it could be filled, which, you know, is very true, but also passionate and not half-hearted and happenstance and ho-hum. So you have to worship God in the spirit, but boy, the other half, in truth. Did you know there are a lot of lyrics of a lot of worship songs that aren't true, but they're pretty? And people write them, publish them, earn great royalties on them, but they're not true. And so that's why we have to be very careful. We have to all be like Acts 17.11 says the church at Berea was. 
we all have to, even if Paul, the apostle, is speaking, they went home and checked what he taught them against the scriptures. And it's good to even check lyrics against the scripture because the offering they're bringing has to be true. And then the last thing is the one they're giving that offering to. And you know what's interesting? It's very possible for worship people to offer their worship to the audience. And they're totally engaged with how much they can get the audience worked up. Instead of thinking about, is this acceptable in your sight, O Lord? Am I acceptable in your sight, O Lord? I, I want to stop offering until I know there's no unconfessed, unforsaken sin, et cetera, et cetera. So where our worship is pointed is what Revelation 4 is all about. Then it, look what happens when the worship is offered. It starts in verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass with crystal in the middle of the throne, around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Boy, would that be distracting to see those things. And the first creature was like a lion, the second was like a calf, the third was like a face of a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. And what are we talking about here? Of course, we know they're the cherubim. We find them in the Old Testament. We find them even on the standards that, that were the tribal standards because when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they were very orderly. They marched in groupings of you know, the three tribes, three tribes, three tribes, three tribes, and they each had a standard, and each of them actually came behind one of the four cherubim standards. I mean, these, the cherubim were featured, they were, they were on the curtains, they were, you know, over the Ark of the Covenant. You say, wow, what is all that for? Well, they're even, look at this. It says, they, the first one had the face like a lion. Well, it says he was like a lion, but in the Old Testament it says that they had a face, they had a cherubim is a, Satan was a cherubim, is a cherubim. He's just a bad one. So we know what Satan looks like. He doesn't wear red tights and have a pointed tail. He has four faces. And the first face is like a lion. The second face, you see, is like an ox. And the third face is like a man. And the last face is like an eagle. And these four-faced creatures, four of them, are always flying around the throne of God. Why? Well, if you think about it, I call it a theocentric orbit. God's in the middle, and they're always rotating him, kind of like the satellites that do our communication have geocentric orbits. They stay at 22,000, what is it, 22,300 or 22,600 miles away from the Earth, so that three of them, are, you're able to triangulate and never lose the signal because those three satellites are in geosynchronous orbits. Cherubim are in theo, as in God, synchronous orbits. And so at any given moment, if you, and someday we'll be standing there, you can check this out. If you're standing at God's throne and look this way, you'll see one of the four cherubim faces. If you look that way, you'll see the second face, lion, you'll see an ox, you see a man, you'll see an eagle. So what? That's the four Gospels. Matthew right? You've already studied this. Matthew, he's the king. That's the lion. You know, it's, it's a picture of royalty. Uh, Mark, he's a servant. That's the ox. That's the, you know, that's kind of the picture of a, of a servant. Uh, Luke, he's the perfect man. That's the man. And what does John talk about? Christ is like God in human flesh. He's like an eagle. You know, they used to say the eagles flew closest to God. They were the highest flying thing. And so even the throne is hearkening back to the Old Testament to the marching of the tribes, and to everything in the tabernacle, but it's pointing to the future that Christ will forever be our perfect king, son of man, the, the one who was a suffering servant who is God the Son. So, oh, it's amazing. Verse 7, or I mean verse 8, and the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes and around within, and they don't rest night or day. And they say the only attribute of God that's emphasized the highest emphasis it can get, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is and was. But what I wrote, I wrote, what happens when we worship? Most of our lives are dominated by the physical world, our health, the weather, our family, our car, our job. 
but the Holy Scriptures, each of us hold, were designed to transport our minds away from our physically dominated world that is easiest for us to see and feel, and transport our minds to the spiritually dominated world. My body only works in this physical world, and it just wants to stay here as long as possible, and it's very interested and curious, and it wants to be a part of everything in the physical world. But inside my body lives my eternal, infinite spirit given to me by God, and that spirit longs. Remember what Paul said, the tension? For I desire to depart and to be with Christ, but it is better for me to stay with you. You know, you need to have someone in the body teaching you. But I would rather my spirit, Paul's spirit was so matured and strengthened and longing after Christ. This world was not his home and he didn't, wasn't just passing through. He couldn't wait to get there. But most of us aren't quite there yet. We're dominated by this world. That's why you see what I have, the last part of that slide, Colossians 3.1 is a choice. What does Colossians 3.1 say? Set your affections on things above not on things on the earth. So even though our body wants to be living for this place, our desires are supposed to be chosen by us to be set on things above. Okay, what's, what's going on around the throne? Uh, let's go to Ezekiel 1. Everything that's described in Revelation isn't new. I've said that so many times. Uh, it's all hearkening. It's, it's to make us go back and to see the wonder of inspiration and what God has done in his word. Uh, look, look at what the throne of God is like in uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. And I looked, and a great whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud, raging fire, engulfing itself, and brightness was around it, and radiant, like the midst of the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Oh, a lot of people have trouble. I was at a, a shop in Galilee once, waiting in line for something. I'd live in Israel if I could afford it. I just love being over around, you know, living around all the Bible stuff. But Bonnie and I were there, we were a month with our family, and, and, uh, and I was at this shop, and I was listening to two Jews talk, and they were, praise the Lord, talking in English. And they study the, the Old Testament, and one of them says, what is the chapter one of Ezekiel about? And I thought, I can understand, I don't even know Hebrew, and I could hear. And they started talking about it. They said, what is all that stuff? Sounds like a lot of us, uh, wondering. Look at verse 5, and from within came the likeness of four creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and, one, and they had four faces. Each one had four wings. Their legs were straight. The soles of their feet were like soles of calves. This is weird stuff. It just sounds, you know, like, I don't know, Disney or something. It's strange. Uh, but all of a sudden, it makes sense when you realize that they're talking about the cherubim. Verse 10, the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, uh, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle, verse 10. There we go. Now we've got those four. Now it's all sinking. But number one, when you see God's throne, always around it is this raging fire and these sparkling ones that are covered with eyes, and they glitter, and they're almost like effervescent. They're, they're like when you're on a cruise boat looking out the back and the phytoplankton is lighting up in the, in the wake. You don't have to be in a cruise boat, by the way. If you go into travel work, it works in other parts of the world. But you see this, this effervescent, sparkling light. That's what heaven's like. It doesn't stop there. Uh, verse 13. And the likeness of living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and torches going back and forth. And fire was bright, and out of it went lightning. God's throne is not like sitting in hour after hour of lectures here. You just, you'll be overstimulated when you're there. Uh, you're just like this. It's just like you can't take it all in. You're just looking, and these creatures are flying around, and there's lightning going, and there's, there's like a furnace, the fire, and then the smoke, and it's just unbelievable. And then there are these... Verse 18, and their rims were so high, they were awesome. Their rims were full of eyes around the four of them. Do you know what's happening? We're getting to the edge of what a human can describe. Ezekiel is seeing something, and he doesn't know what it is. And he's busily obeying God and writing it down. And he's just trying to put words. And verse 19, when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures were lifted up, the wheels were lifted up. And he just said, what is going on? Wow, 
That's what it looks like around God's throne. And look at verse 22. It says, The likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. Imagine, you know, in heaven, things that are so little and hard to get on earth are giant. Do you realize that the gates going into heaven are made of one pearl? That means the gates are 1,200 mile high pearls. Oh, how big was the oyster? You know what I mean? Can you imagine heaven, the walls are 1,500 miles high, but the gate is at least 1,200 miles high. It's, and, and, well, I'm going to wait till we get to heaven because there's something to think about. Why did God pick pearl for the gates? There has to be a reason. And then look at verse 24. Here's the last thing around the throne. The sounds of mighty water and sparkling like, uh, like burning fire. And when I went, I heard the noise of their wings. It was like the noise of many waters. And a voice came, verse 25, from the firmament. And verse 26, uh, the likeness of the throne. And verse 27, from his waist upward, I saw the color of amber. And around and within, and his waist downward, brightness, the brightness of fire. That's where any worship we offer arrives. Now, to get it closer to us, what I just read, that for some of you was old hat because you've read it so many times, for some of you it was brand new, and for some of you don't even care. You know, because remember, I know that all seven types of Christians are out here. And I know that out here are some sardis, dead as a doornail, and this doesn't impress me stuff. And then there are some Philadelphians. I mean, you're ready to unbuckle your seatbelt and you want to go crash some plane and tell people about Christ. And we have everything in between. But wherever you are in the spectrum of Christianity, this is what we're all going to see. And it's going to be amazing. I, I will add one more thing that um, Daniel adds. Daniel 7, um, that's the next book, Ezekiel, Daniel. He tells us something that, since I read this, it's fascinated me, starting in verse 9. And I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. This sounds just like Revelation 1. Did you notice that? His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels were burning fire. Now look at verse 10. And a fiery river issued and came out from before him. So the Ancient of Days is seated on the throne, and at his feet steps, and out from the steps flows a river of fire. Wow. It came forth from him. What does Hebrews say? Our God is a consuming what? Fire. He, he is, Isaiah says, when I read through the Bible, remember I told you I read through it once a month and looked for something every time. The first time was looking for all the names and titles and ascriptions of God. You know what one of them is in Isaiah? He is the everlasting burnings. And, and what Daniel sees right here is that this fiery river is coming out in front of his throne and a thousand thousands minister to him. A thousand times a thousand is a million. So millions of angels are moving around kind of like bees in a beehive and they're ministering to him while 10,000 times 10,000 are standing I did an Excel chart, and if you just take the normal space it takes to stand and be able to fall down on your face and get back up and just make a square footage for that and then multiply that out for millions and hundreds of millions, being a Michigander, the throne of God, if this is the state of Michigan, the throne of God would take up one half of the lower peninsula if you made a big circle and made enough room for all those people to be getting on their faces. And we only have the angels. We don't even have us in there yet because we're in the, the inner circle because there's those 24 thrones. So what do we see in heaven? We see a throne, a river of fire, a sea of glass, these living ones that are uh, flying around, the 24 elders that are seating in these countless angels that Daniel's talking about. It's awesome. Now think about this. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before that throne. And if you look at the words that are inspired, 
For we must all appear, Greek word phanerothenai, which exactly means this. Everyone's going to, there's nothing we can hide. Everyone's going to see what we really were. Whether or not we really lived for Christ and to what degree. For we must all appear. It's the, the word is heskaton, one by one. We come one by one. And everyone sees what we really were in front of that amazing throne. You know, Paul built his ministry around it. That, that's the acro Corinthus. That's the high place of Corinth. This is the Bema seat that Paul talks about. Uh, that's, that's where uh, Seneca's brother Gallio sat and, you know, intervened when they were trying to hurt Paul. That actual place is there. And when you go to the Holy Land, you, you, that's one of the, I mean, when you go to the life of Paul in Greece, you go and see that. And that's the word. We must all appear for the bema of Christ. And what is it? It's the moment. It's the moment when we receive the things we did with our body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. Boy, that bothers people. Bad? I thought, I thought my sins were gone. It isn't the word bad for sin. It's a different word. It's the word faulon, not kakos. It's faulon. And faulon means good for nothing. Other ways it's translated, it's translated for a swirl of steam. Like in the morning, where our cabin is, whenever it's cold and the, you know, here on Scroon Lake and the sun comes down and, if the ice is melted, and the sun comes down and the light touches the water, you'll get a little wisp of steam that will move. That's the word foul on. It means it's something that appears for a little while and it's gone. You can't grab it. You can't hold it. It's just gone. It's also the word for what we call dust devils, when wind blows down the street and it picks up you know, little bits of trash or leaf or dust or dirt, and you see this tornadic kind of little swirl, and it's gone. You can't get them. God says everything we do in life, once he erases the record of our sin, either comes out good, eternal, going to last forever, or good for nothing. And that's going to be what's revealed in front of his throne. Philippians 3.3 adds one more thing to this. Paul said this, Philippians 3.3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in our flesh. Did you catch that? Born-again Christians have circumcised hearts. We get a new heart so that we can worship God. So what I wrote is true believers are worshipers. We're all worshipers. And in Revelation 4 and 5, we see a future picture of all of us true worshipers, worshiping at the highest level. The next thing I saw here is uh, Revelation 4, 8 tells us exactly how God wants to be worshiped. And verses 9 and 10 talk about his holiness. You're going to be reading that this week. Verse 11, it's completely focused on God. But let's go back to where we started. Okay, hey, we have... Four minutes. Everybody ready? I'm going to do a field trip. Everybody ready? Everybody stand with me, please. And we're going to quote the Lord's Prayer. You ready? All of you know it by heart. Only since I just described for you the throne, I want you to think about we're going to be standing around that thing with all those creatures and all that lightning and everything else, and you're going to be looking up at the Lord, and this is how he wants us while we're on earth to focus on him, okay? So you can say the Lord's Prayer out loud, with your eyes open or closed or whatever, but think of him. Here we go. Let's say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What? You may be seated. Now guess what? Look at this. And I'm going to go through this really fast. Jesus told us exactly what our seven greatest needs would be while we go through life in that Lord's Prayer. Number one, I need God to focus me. How often do you think about the throne of God and him sitting there? Not very often if you're normal. And what's the first phrase of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed, 
to hallow something means it, 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 you respond because it impacts you so much. God says, I want to impact your life. I need you to control me. Your kingdom come. I need you to lead me. I want your will done in my life. I don't want to do my own thing. I need you to supply me. Give me this day. Why is that so important? I want to see God's hand on a daily basis, supplying me what I need so I can serve him. I need you to cleanse me. Forgive us our trespasses. But, but in verse 14, after the Lord's prayer is done, he said, if you won't forgive people that harm you, I won't forgive you. Boy, that's a sobering verse, but I'm not covering Matthew, and I don't have to tell you the implications of it. I need God to protect me, especially when we get to next week. We have no idea the power and the malignity of these demonic creatures. I need God's protection. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. And you know how the Lord's Prayer ends? For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Do you know what that's saying? For thine is everything. So what I need to do is be emptied of living for me, and I want, I want to serve you humbly. Now, I've told you, and I haven't shown you one of these, um, lately, that I always write an application prayer. So after going through, uh, this is another example. I wrote this, Lord, you're watching my life, you're recording every part, you know what I'm feeling, or what I'm feeding on, stir my hunger for your word. See the asking God to do something based on his word. You're setting open doors of ministry before me. Help me to go through them and serve you with all my heart. Fear surrounds me as the world crumbles. Help me believe you and fear not. As I see what you've planned for this world, help me to live for what's eternal. I want to more and more hear what you say and respond to your spirit. 